one of the things that I look back on when I was living in New York is just how much I don't really feel like I got to explore the city. And so I'm curious, what's your favorite spot in New York? So for a while, you know, especially because I worked in the area, I really came to love Fort Green Park. It's this beautiful little uh, oasis in a, in a part of the city that is changing rapidly. But there's so many little joys in there. You know, there's a bench dedicated to Richard Wright, uh, the author of Native Son. Of course, there's the uh, monument in the center, this, this large monolith or obelisk uh, that, that was used as the backdrop for Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It. Uh, there's there's so much to it. I loved going there. I loved walking around. Um, Kyle, I know that I, I once saw you there actually playing Pokemon Go uh, while I was while I was reading. But I've also really grown to love. Uh, you know that that's an area that's getting uh, more and more attention, positive or negative. But a lot of people in the park. The one that I've grown to love recently is Corona Park in Queens, which was the the site of the 1964, well, the 30s and the 64 World's Fair. Um, my, my partner and I went there on an, on an early date of ours, uh, cause I'm a romantic like that, uh, and walked around and looked at the kind of rusted out relics of the 64 world's fair, this last remnant of the new frontier ideals and seeing, seeing things like the Unisphere or the New York state pavilion, or this, this piece of column that was brought over from ancient Jerusalem and, and all of this. And to realize that what was once a bustling World's Fair is now kids are skateboarding inside the, the base of the Unisphere. You know, people walk by and hang out and sit underneath this sculpture that must have cost thousands of thousands of dollars, and they don't have any idea where it came from, and they don't care. You know, you can walk through that entire park, and you know, how many times do we all drive past that park or walk past that park and kind of look up, and what used to be the New York State Pavilion and the Observation Towers, at most we remember it for Men in Black. The, the reason I love that is not just the history, but the fact that that's such a testament to what New York is, which is that it will continue. And that uh, not rather than this Ozymandias idea of look upon my works in despair and there's just sh- feet and you don't know where they came from. All of the pieces that made old New York, old New York, all of the pieces of this history are still there. And you can dig into them when you want to. You can go there specifically to see where they buried the time capsule at the World's Fair. But you can also exist and live an entire life with that as part of your backdrop without ever knowing where it came from. And I think that kind of captures what's so magical about this city. Um, with me, it's got to be Patsy's Pizzeria up in Harlem. It's a spot my dad introduced me and my brother to. Um, it would always be our little tradition after we went to Yankee games. And well, still is, but I mean, well, we're not going to Yankee games this year, but um, it was a place he went to when he was a kid back in the 70s. It's, uh, you know, he would he would go up there with friends or when he was working and he was nearby, he'd go to Patsy's. He, he always told us it was the best pizza he ever had. And um, he started taking us. And it is I mean, I'm a bit of a pizza snob being a big guinea. Um, I just, I'm um, just the the way it connects to the past of New York. That it was this, it was the second pizzeria in New York, and it's still here. And it went through a lot. It's seen a lot. The way Harlem almost was like this bustling place to the way Harlem fell, and how Harlem was a, kind of a rough place for a long time. It's still there now as Harlem is kind of seeing its swing, but Patsy's is still there. It's still the same oven, it's still the same pizza. It's this connection between the past, the New York of then and the New York of now. And it's just also this connection that I have um, for as rough and frayed as the relationship with me and my father can be. It's this one thing that we could like have this, like we both can carry on and have this connection to. Uh, I just feel. The, the the history in many ways of New York and my family and all this stuff with, with Patsy's and every time I go there, it's just I feel connected to something larger uh, than myself. And um, I hope Patsy's is uh, able to survive this bullshit we're going through in 2020. I hope it's still here for a long time to come. 
and uh, I can't wait to get uh, Patsy's again. Maybe, honestly, I may even call to see what their situation is, and I might go for a drive to Harlem tomorrow and get some Patsy's myself right now. This nightlife is our speed, old bean. We're talking 1928's The Crowd, here on You're Missing Out, with special guest David Sims. Our guest today is staff writer at The Atlantic, and he is one of the hosts of Blank Check with Griffin and David, a favorite show of, of mine and Tom's. Uh, we're so glad to have him here. David Sims is joining us to talk about The Crowd. Hey, guys. How you doing? Can I call you David? Uh, certainly. Yes. No, I mean, physically, can I? Because uh, the first like couple months that we knew each other, I only referred to you as Mr. Sims, oh. uh, and I uh, got taunted for that at my old job. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, not a lot of people call me Mr. Sims out there, but I appreciate it. You can call me Mr. Sim. I, uh, well, you know, that might get confusing because uh, the film you picked today also involves uh, a Mr. Sims and a Mrs. Sims and, and many true. Sims. Was yes, that no, uh, no, I, I, I had forgotten that I'd seen this film before, but had forgotten that the main, the title character is that's my father's name, John Sims. And <laughs> Ma- Mary, even is the, Mary is the woman, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm well then I'm I and not to jump ahead but I'm I'm very sorry about uh your sister getting hit by that car. That, that's <laughs> terrible. And that was a rough that was a rough one for you. Yeah. And then uh and then you uh obviously disappearing in the sequel. But we'll touch on that later. Um mm-hmm. Yes, there is a there's a sequel. Uh I watched it. Weird. Uh it's a I weird have one. never seen the sequel. I eager to hear Oh, our daily it, bread? Yeah. No, I I know of it, but yeah. They literally uh what did what did you say Tom? They they uh It's they, uh, the original Cunningham kid. Kid, yeah, the kid just goes upstairs and <laughs> just, just disappears. They forget the kid even exists. Wow, never comes up in the sequel. Um, but we're talking about the crowd, and I'm so excited that you chose this one. I sent you a list of films, but I was secretly, uh, quietly, you know, fingers crossed, hoping you would pick this because I'd seen you give it five stars on Letterboxd, and I really wanted to get someone on who who knew this film. And that's not a lot of people because it's uh, practically non-existent. It is hard to watch. I can't even remember the first time I saw it. I think it must might have been on. Filmstruck or some deceased streaming service a few years back. But uh, it's one of those movies that I was kind of like, oh, well, I should, you know, I should expand my like knowledge of silent films beyond the sort of, you know, couple dozen movies everyone sort of knows and has heard of and has been shown maybe in film school or whatever. And they, not that this is not a famous film, but like you say, it's always been a little harder to find um and it blew me away i just remember like instantly being like the, those early shots of like the buildings and stuff i was just like oh whoa, 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 whoa. and so uh it's one of my favorite movies it's always yeah it's been one of my favorite movies for years i was very glad you uh presented it to me um i'm you know i'm i'm thrilled and there it was one of those ones that i knew when we were sending out uh asks to folks that it was one of the ones that would probably not get a a lot of volunteers because, uh, you know, folks kind of stay away from the silent films in general. Uh, and especially a list that has things like Casablanca or Citizen sure, Kane sure. or what have you. I was so excited to dive into this one. There's a little bit, I mean, there's an element of the film itself, which is important. There's also something interesting about, you know, we're going through the National Film Registry induction year by induction year. Mm-hmm. And I think what's so interesting is the films that were picked in 1989, that first class of 25 when they picked them you got this sense that all of the ones they picked were like oh these are obvious these are such obvious like we gotta we have to get them in and it's interesting to see which ones have sort of fallen out of favor in the last 30 years or so yeah i mean this one the learning tree learning tree sort of uh i'm I'm looking at the the early one because yes you're right mostly it is like the canon like it is they these movies are all parts of different canons, right? Yeah. And is there anything else that that you to me? Think? I think the I'm I'm excited when we eventually do the Grapes of Wrath for the fact that that went from being a movie that a movie rules. It went from being a movie that everyone knew and was considered the great American film, and now no one no one watches it, no one talks about it. And you're right. It's it's great. It's absolutely. We just did um, the Searchers, so I did. All, me and Tom both did a huge John Ford binge recently. Yeah, I can't wait to get to that one. I haven't gotten to Grapes of Wrath yet, but love me some Ford. I think it is tagged with the rep of like being Steinbeck. So, you know, it has that kind of like high school. Uh, you're forced to read it slash watch it. Reputation, not probably not watch it anymore, but right, you know, right, like this. Or yeah. Like, um so maybe it's seen as this kind of like broccoli kind of movie but it is so 
so good. I love the Grapes of Wrath. I, I would, you know, maybe I should have. The Learning Tree is obviously a great movie. It's just, it's funny that that seems to be in this early list like that's their sort of acknowledgement to black cinema right like i'm trying to th- is there anything else in that in the first year no five no. no so it's, no. it's sort of interesting that that's the one that was picked and it's interesting that intolerance was picked um yeah the, the, the national film registry is i don't really know much about its process i don't know how these movies are identified and settled on. I'm sure you guys know more than me. Uh, well, there's actually, if you're bored, uh, if you find yourself sitting around with nothing to do, David, uh, there's a documentary called These Amazing Shadows that was about ah. the registry and going through how they pick it and what they decide, and you get to see John Singleton's a talking head in it and Christopher right. Nolan and a bunch of people and and you know how they decide on each thing and, and uh, Leonard Malton arguing on behalf of some weird niche crap, and it's uh, very exciting. That sounds but, cool. You know, so that's been exciting for us to kind of go through that and see what's what's coming ahead with the crowd. We always uh, starts off uh, reading why the National Film Registry uh, picked this film. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read a statement, their statement for why they selected this film, and then we'll get into it uh, more specifically. Uh, everybody, bear in mind this is a this is a long one. So with the crowd, King Vidor repeated the artistic success he had achieved a few years earlier with the Big Parade but the film's downbeat realism thwarted the commercial success of his earlier effort. It stars Vidor's wife, Eleanor Boardman, and James Murray, who the director had discovered, ironically, in a crowd of extras just prior to filming. In this realistic tale of a young couple's struggles, the film's cinematography plays a role as big as those of its two lead actors. Its most memorable interior shot climbs from street level up columns of skyscrapers through a window into a sea of desks manned by pencil pushers, until the camera finally reveals a close-up of the lead actor played by Murray. Cinematographer Henry Sharp mastered inventive and visceral interior shots, and with the help of a hidden camera, his New York exteriors, including scenes at Coney Island, convey excitement and spontaneity. The dynamic visuals of the crowd are alternately in concert and in contrast with the highly emotional screenplay written by John V.A. Weaver and director Vidor, and the naturalistic performances of Boardman and Murray as they explore the faceless, soulless nature of the modern city. So that's why they said it was inducted. And clearly they had a lot to say. Uh, David, uh, mm. they don't always. When we did Star Wars, they just gave us a three-sentence uh, plot synopsis. So they yeah, give us I a mean, lot to dig into right. here, which is nice, and I'm sure we have a lot to dig into with this one. You said you'd seen this before. Uh, I had caught parts of it on Turner Classic and then could never find it again. And Tom, this was your first time watching it, right? Yeah, first time. Never heard of it before. I mean, I've heard the name King Vidor. And um, when I watched it, I kind of just went in blind. All I did was check the runtime so I could know like when I, I was be able to watch it. And uh, yeah, it really, uh, really blew my hair back at how kind of uh, timely and timeless it is. Like it feels other than being a silent movie, like this feels very much like a movie thematically and all that you could see like today. Yes, it feels like a total sort of building block movie for the you know so many kinds of stories that got told and you know there's the Godard quote I assume you guys have heard the Godard quote which was how I first heard of this movie maybe you guys haven't heard the Godard quote have you guys heard the Godard quote uh, Godard. if I have it's 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 slipped my mind but I'm very invested if I know anything it, about it, our relationships with Godard Tom has checked out and I'm very invested there there's some <laughs> point at the 60s you know Godard's making this movies where he's asked I assume the slightly flippant question of like why aren't your movies more about ordinary people because Godard's movies especially in you know his early movies are so stylish and so on you know and like so sort of uh indulgent of you know kind of cool and fantasy and all that you know you know what i'm saying yeah and his response was quote the crowd had already been made so why remake it like his wow. his take is like there's there there will never be a more sort of like seismic and elemental movie about like the human experience of being ordinary and striving to like stand out like you know then the crowd the crowd is it tom you have the crowd to blame for your miserable junior year of college when we took the french new wave class so that's a plus you know you got that uh well i guess uh, <laughs> n- nothing's perfect so i'll, I'll, I'll hold it against it <laughs> david what what's your relationship to king vidor as a, as a filmmaker have you watched much of his other work or no i'm trying to think like i mean obviously his filmography is like you know, 2000 movies deep is, is, is true for a lot of those guys. Like, I mean, obviously like he, I know he worked on the wizard of Oz, like uh, famously that that movie was directed by 
a handful of people and he did all of the Kansas stuff, um, which is probably the thing I know him from best. And I know him as a studio magnate. I've seen The Fountainhead, which is one of his later movies. That's obviously not a silent movie uh, with Gary Cooper, which is bizarre and kind of has the imagery like, you know, like, you know, his 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 effort with scale and with kind of like very simple, broad, emotional love stories like is is visible there. But I haven't seen a lot of his silent work. I'm trying to think what else is there now. No, um, the other major one, I think, is the big parade, which is the one they mentioned in the intro. I have. Is... Right, 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 right. I have seen that. I have. I don't remember it very well, but I have seen the big parade. Yes. I think it's interesting. You mentioned the fountainhead. It's so interesting to get a read on him because obviously he makes this Ayn Rand, you know, objectivist uh, film. And then also around that same time makes Our Daily Bread, which is not only the sequel to The Crowd, but is. I would say the most overtly socialist film I've seen this side of Moss film. So very weird how he jumps around uh, thematically. Um, yeah, I feel like at the time the fountain had obviously now like, you know, Ayn Rand and, and objectivism has been sort of like seized by uh, a certain sector of american politics and american thought but like i feel like at the time people saw it as like well it's this it's a it, it's a hollywood story of nothing else right it's it's a it's a man you know trying to you know uh exist without compromising his vision and and you know all that so you know like there there's so much broad uh heroic kind of narrative to the fountainhead that is more what king vidor probably zeroed in on you know the, the the triumph of the individual spirit, the struggle, like all that stuff, and like, you know, you know, in 1943, you might not be thinking as hard about like what it's, you know, capital A about. I I did a dive through his filmography in, in prep for this because I was just curious, uh, and I I will say, and I hate to sound too dismissive of, of he definitely loses something once sound comes in. Sure, sure. you know. Um, he did the he did the 1956 War and Peace with uh, with Audrey Hepburn and and Henry Fonda, where uh, yeah, Henry Fonda is yeah. the the least convincing Russian you've ever seen on screen. I have never seen that. Yeah, I mean that makes sense to me that like there's such different mediums, even though they're obviously related. Like it, it's it it sort of blows my mind that that leap was kind of just made so rapidly. And it's it's strange who adapts. Like we just our last episode we recorded. I don't know if it'll come out. But the last episode we recorded was The Searchers, and we were talking about John Ford being able to go from silent to sound and right. sound to color, and he was just like, I got this. And Vidor, I mean, I, I liked Our Daily Bread, and, and, and I liked some of the films he did after, and his final film is some weird What the Bleep Do We Know-esque film called Truth and Delusion, an introduction to metaphysics. Guy had a hey. weird career, but I did watch The Crowd, and I looked at this incredible uh sense of, of visual storytelling and wondered like how is that going to translate into sound and it turns out not not well um not not a lot which is interesting well, but because the the crowd is so broad and the emotions are so basic but i don't mean basic in a bad way like it's such it's such a broad metaphorical story it's so perfect for the silent medium like if they were just if they were talking like it would probably feel thin like you know the 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 things the obstacles being thrown up and like the whole sort of narrative yeah, well we'll talk about it yeah well that's i mean we can get into it whenever i'm not you know but our daily bread has that problem it's it's the same characters but they recast them because by this point uh james it's murray a- was uh was uh not having the best time oh really uh, is it- that why oh man he was panhandling god i'm re- i'm just reading about this that's he- that sucks. Lives the story of the crowd. Wow. I'm I'm so glad this is the uh, David. I'm so glad you're on because you are doing real time research and I love I it. Know. It's it's so I exciting. Know. Well, I um, right yeah. I, I just I I knew that he was recast yeah. and I just assumed it was like well that's Hollywood baby like you know and and now the, reading this story of like King Vidor like trying to help him and be like look if you can pull yourself together you know we, we can put you in the movie. And Murray like rejecting him, like they, they, this is this like crazy human tragedy. He he dies by falling in the river, like <laughs> like a couple years later. Like th- this is this is bleak. Yeah, I, I my Tom and and Kyle, our producer, know that I sometimes go on uh, deep dives of 
uh, forgotten obscure actors, and I gave them fair warning as soon as we finished this. I'm like, he's the next one. Uh, wow. James Murray is going to be my new Arthur Lake. I'm just going to go deep down a rabbit hole. Um, but when you watch Daily Bread, the new actor he gets to play uh, John Sims, you're, you're right. It's very broad. Like he's playing just, well, shucks, I'll tell right. you what we're going to do. And it doesn't land. Whereas in this, it's so captivating from the start now I, I let's i have one note about the beginning of the film and then we can kind of go all over the place which is and i don't mean to to dip into the personal here david but uh, mm-hmm. you know on your on your way the gun episode uh mm-hmm. of blank check which at the time of recording is recently out by the time this episode drops you guys will probably be on to an entire new uh mini series <laughs> but mm-hmm. um you mentioned you know hope for the future and, and you made a comment about uh you know you said wanting to start a family and so i just wanted to ask are you planning on having the child on the 4th of July so that you can use that <laughs> title card of what is the Declaration of Independence compared to what's happening in the Sims household? Is that a plan? I don't, I don't think so, because you can only pull that off if you're having your baby on the 4th of July on the turn of the century, right? At, on, at 1990. I mean, 1900. That is... Uh, that is the only way to pull that off. A 4th of I July mean, baby. I, I, you're saying that to a person who was supposed to be a Fourth of July baby on 1990, oh, wow. and it didn't work. So wow. we see how that failed. But no, I mean, that's that's how we start. We start with this this new life, and it's this very kind of quick journey of this character. We when we were mostly focused on on well, we we balance the time between John and Mary, but it's mostly focused on on John, who is our. Uh, who is our kind of emotional rock and home. And he is, I, I feel like every man is overused, but he is kind of is sort of the every man, especially for the time, that sort of that post world war one spirit of the go getter that is kind of encapsulated by like Harold Lloyd in his films. But of course this is not nearly as uh, goofy right. or zany as a Harold Lloyd. Funny. Right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so much, even from the start uh, little things that, when you're watching this kind of catch you off guard uh the the just showing the transition to days and the falling cards and and little things that already tell you oh okay this guy knows if you don't know can you do it or anything that already tells you okay this guy's trying things and i know it may seem like a minor thing but when you've watched enough of these older films <laughs> for the show yeah. you get excited when you see somebody trying something well i think you know I, the beginning kind of really does prime you for this movie maybe being like David said, broad and in a good way, just for like, oh, it's the t- literally the turn of the century, uh, born on the 4th of July, and this kid's gonna go places, he's gonna be the, he's gonna be president one day, and, you know, you kinda set you up for that journey without, you know, tipping over into, I don't know, being too unsubtle or whatnot, I just think it's a pretty good way to prime you for what's about to come, although not everything that's about to come because there's a turn <laughs> that really uh took me by surprise half well, i guess halfway through this movie the one thing i appreciated about this is how despite having these exquisite uh and and well thought out artistic shots it is kind of minimalist compared to a lot of silence at the time because there's no big dramatic death scenes people are not you know flailing their hands out in in shock or repulsion it's the 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 death of the mother john's mother at the beginning is you just see a stretcher and a long hallway and a child and being told, well, you have to be brave now. And that's how they convey that information. That, that, I mean, that is when I think I sort of snapped to attention when I was watching this movie. Like it's like you say, obviously subtle film. I mean, silent films are subtlety is not a word you associate them up with, you know, because you need to be so broad as an actor to convey the emotion, but like just, the kind of starkness of that. And this is a movie that's coming out like on the cusp of the depression, like to think of like how many, you know, as America's, you know, population is exploding. And, and, and so like to think of the amount of people in the audience who would have gone through something like that, it doesn't feel ludicrous or, you know, excessively tragic or whatever, you know, like back then in 19, the early 1900s, like just that kind of like, well, there's nothing to be done about it. Like, you know, it's just, this is just how it is. And it's, it's such a, you know, it it was a tough watch uh, at this particular time as well. Uh, There was a lot of, I think had I, you know, had we watched this film in, I don't know, 2015, Maybe maybe we would have gone, oh, remember how it used to be. But now there's so much of it that does kind of feel very analogous. You know, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. and not just, the, you know, the launch ring, but even just 
I when I was watching this, uh, and you know, I've been candid on the show about being uh, thirty and and unemployed amidst a global pandemic and not feeling great. And uh, you know, I'm here in New York. We're all uh, Kyle sound in Florida, but the rest of us are all uh, New Yorkers. And uh, seeing the title card, when John was 21, he became one of the seven million that believe New York depends on them. Uh, it just felt like a yeah. weight in my gut. That was that was unbelievable. And yeah, it's it's it really is crazy. This came out a year before the depression hit, and just like it's just one of those magical movie moments of like this guy was really keyed into something and really just delivered and uh it yeah i it must have been wild to see this movie and then like a year later really capitalism just failed right like the whole the whole premise of what he's doing kind of was exposed yeah and and that's the thing that really really kind of blew my mind like going into this blind of just how in 1928 you know this must have been crazy watching a movie about this guy really just like taking to test the entire idea of like oh yeah you could just become like one of the seven million office drones and you'll will make you feel like you're important but you're not you're just just some disposable thing that we won't even remember when you quit and leave the office or whatever it's just like you're just a cog in the machine and if you you quit we could just very easily replace you and your life will be miserable because that's just, if you're not working, you're not important. Uh, yeah. And there's so much, I mean, I think about, uh, you know, they're, they're weirdly similar despite being, you know, completely different genres, but, you know, you watch something like Fritz Lang's Metropolis and the way that it, it basically shows its characters, its extras as human cattle. And, uh, you know, your brain kind of go is trying to do the work of, oh, well, this is a metaphor for how it is now. And then he just turns around, Vidor turns around and he goes, no, I'm just going to show you how it is now. I'm just literally going to show you this is your day to day every day. You know, the the camera panning over the desks, panning up those Blade Runner-esque buildings. Uh, it's oh, I that, couldn't get over how stunning that sequence that, is. That, that wide shot of him at his desk for the first time and incredible. you just see him in the row, the sea of other men sitting at their desk, just little just little cogs in the machine it was just i was yeah i think that that shot might have been the, the the moment that really sucked me in of where i realized like exactly what this movie was gonna be because like i said i had no idea so and it yeah the, king vidor really just shot the hell out of this movie it's it it's it's again it's another of those early shots that makes you kind of snap to attention because i mean you think of the apartment right you think of mm-hmm. like other movies that show like kind of grid like uh oppressive office like life but like here there's that weird like balance he's kind of like striking at where it's like the guy's optimism is so overflowing and the sort of like feeling of well you know i can stick out like is 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 so narratively important but it does feel like it's not exactly like cripplingly depressing but it's so bleak to kind of see him immediately shoved into this like you know this monolith and i it's not surprising that this movie was not a hit because like i don't know what audiences would really make of it like i do think it's a it's a weirdly triumphant movie like despite all of the insane tragedy and the that general sort of bleakness that i'm talking about but like imagine like sitting down like a in the audience and like trying to figure out what to take away from it. I, I feel like audiences might have kind of been into it for like the first half because of the love story and like right. the, the kids are getting born. But then when the daughter gets hit by the car and it, cause from then on, it's just a series of never ending, just miseries and failures. And um, I know the ending, the very ending was like a big, kind of problem with the movie like they kept they had a bunch of different endings that just wasn't working until they Mm -hmm. settled on the um them sitting and watching the show which i mean i guess it's kind of the best case scenario for like it's a happy ending but not like obnoxiously out of place happy ending it still leaves a lot of like well they're still he's still a juggler making a pittance yeah. And he's got a wife and a kid to still feed. Like, there's not, this still isn't the greatest of endings, triumphant or anything. So, 
Um, I think, yeah, I, I think the second half is where probably when audiences just went, oh, no. Like, what the hell am I supposed to make make of this? Right. You know? Yeah. But that's what's sort of brilliant about the movie. But anyway, you know, the, the second half is challenging. But the first half is definitely laying out the kind of fallacy of his his whole dream of sticking out of the crowd. What struck I mean, me, too, when I was watching it was I ended up going on a weird uh, Google search where I was trying to figure out, and bear with me, uh, if if King Vidor was, was of Jewish ancestry. Mm. Uh, and I say that because I kept thinking of, I've been reading some of um, Shalom Aleichem's, uh, you know, Tevye the Dairyman stories and all that. And I just felt that there is that sense of, you know, that that Job esque story, or you know, any of those, like I said, the you know the, yeah. the Tevi the Dairyman stories, where there is this kind of storytelling in that tradition, in in the Yiddish literature tradition, that is kind of like this arc of bad things happen and we get through them, and we yeah. find the little joys where we can, and that's not really common in American storytelling, especially not now. I kind of wonder if the Coens have ever seen this movie. Oh, like, I, 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 like like I like I, I want to hear what they would say about it because like. You just saying that was like, oh, a simple, a simple man. And then you just think of everything else they've done. Like, oh, yeah, no, that's this is kind of literally what they do like a lot. Oh, well, that this, this simple man is, is, I believe, I think, going to win the award for the most Jewish film uh, ever made. Right. I think we're all that's just kind of there's there's so much that starts with the Dybbuk that already gets the prize. But no, I did. I did wonder about that and, and, and how that's kind of an uncommon. And I guess it's also a case of. There's a struggle with these older films, these kind of pre-code uh, films and these early silent films, because there's so much that we think of as, oh, they didn't do these things in movies back then, but we're just kind of used to 30s and 40s films that were a bit more limited in what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think about it even kind of explicit. There's there's in the first half, you know, they get married, they go on their honeymoon and there is a lot of uh, overtly uh, sexual you know, humor and innuendo in that that yeah. I you would not get again uh, for a while. I'm always thrown anytime there's uh, adult humor in an old film. Not negatively thrown, but just surprised. Like, oh, they're doing that. Okay. I mean, I guess this probably doesn't even count as pre-code because I think pre-code yeah, really that's... more applies to like, you know, uh, talkies. But but yeah, certainly there is there's the the whole thing with the, the book, the like the marital book. Yeah, that, what a young assume... husband ought to know. Uh, yeah, which, um, by the way, is readable. I Googled it. It's in the Gutenberg project. Yeah. Oh, I've read I've read portions. It's wild. Yeah, it is. It is quite wild. Um, and uh, and like I, the reason I was sort of like clicking around on it when I was watching, I was like, how frank like because the movie, as you say, kind of feels frank, like uh, uh, like so how frank would like a book like that be? And you read it and you're like, oh, OK, not frank at all, uh, like, you know, completely flowery and kind of like moralistic and all that but um oh yeah, if no, you the, want a the, wild read look up what a young wife should know oh boy mm. the worst the worst um what was it uh, yeah right um so, but yeah like that early segment you know, of course you've got like you said it's his childhood and all that but then right the the early kind of verite stuff like the niagara falls coney island like the new york city street stuff the, the stuff that they somehow like whatever captured with hidden cameras and all that kind of stuff like that just feels revolutionary at a moment oh, yeah. like this right like i mean it's just there and there are such moments of artificiality in the movie like the skyscraper like the office like but then like to sort of mix in this like very tactile very understandable very like that's what i love about his whole message of like look you might struggle to stick out as an individual or to you know achieve whatever your like lofty american dreams are but like there's so much joy in all the little stuff well, and especially, you know, you mentioned Coney Island, and that's such a symbol, especially for New Yorkers, but in, you know, in New York and film of the the kind of working class Disney world. It's where everyone can come together and take their mind off of the uh, nightmare that our lives may be. Right. I right. mean, you've you've lived here, uh, you know, a good long time, David. You've I'm sure you've been to Coney Island plenty of times. Certainly, yeah, of yeah. course. You know, we all have that, and Tom as well. I know you have, uh, you know, when you were younger, right? Yeah, I had to get back to Coney Island one night. It was really crazy. They blamed me for something and uh, something with Cyrus. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, I've 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 dealt a lot with. Uh, that's a Warriors joke, guys. All right, now I have the Joe Walsh song stuck in my head. Thank you, Tom. That's helpful. Yeah, that's that's why I'm here. 
I love seeing it in older films. There's a, you know, I, I have a, there's a Buster Keaton uh, Fatty Arbuckle film shot uh, at Coney Island that I, I love to look at just to see the old rides and things, but it's so exquisitely captured in this film. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the, the, the shot choices, the angles. I mean, I loved seeing, I'd never seen that before, the little uh, see who's necking tunnel. You know, mm. there's this rich history of Coney Island is kind of the, you know, this this place of vice and like where you could get away. And uh, one of the attractions, they don't show it in this one, but one of the attractions was just something that would blow gusts of air up and you'd see if some woman's skirt would go up. It was, a you know, the the old Coney Island attractions uh, obviously didn't last, but uh, it's such an interesting moment. And I think there's so many New York films do that, uh, even films like uh in uh, Sophie's Choice, they make such a big deal of the, the symbolism of Coney Island as this, this oasis in an otherwise dark place. And, and Vidor makes such good use of that here. I, I just love any, like, as I'm a big, uh, you know, Mike knows this. I love watching these, like, 70s and 80s B movies and all that stuff. And just those movies got such a big boost from filming in New York at the time. But, like, mm-hmm. e- even in this movie, like, just shooting on the streets in 1928 New York maybe 27 i don't know but just it just gets just such a great boost of character that i just i just loved seeing it you know that big wide shot at night with the wonder wheel was you know just like just crack for me and um i i it's just you know there's there's nothing like just being on the streets of new york back when new york had a little more character than it right. had like it, wonder like a you know that right like that's the sort of sensation of it like this weird sense of wonder and I mean, we all, do you ever have that, David, I'll ask you too, especially because you're a historically minded person, do you ever have that weird feeling where you're walking in some part of New York, you know, even if I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm not downtown in, uh, you know, around like Third Street that much anymore. Uh, but if you were going to the IFC to watch a movie or something, and all of a sudden you just kind of look down and realize like, oh, Allen Ginsberg walked the same sidewalk. Sure, sure. You have yeah. those, you know, there's this sense to it and i i think especially with film you know so many people forget that uh the origins of american cinema are in uh new jersey you know that there was not always uh hollywood you know that there is this entire cinematic history of new york and this film captures that so well it does and it's a fair point right like you know hollywood los angeles like all of that like is is sort of primitive at this point like you know that i mean i guess i guess the film industry has been sort of bustling along for more than a decade but um no reason not to set obviously a movie like this in new york which is that mix of like oh it's a city of wonder it's the land of opportunity like you know but also like you are within a staggering amount of people that are all sort of trying to do the exact same thing that you're trying to do. I also think there's something with, with New York that makes it such a, I you know, hate to sound like another person going, it's, it's like a character, but something about New York is the fact that it always seems to almost act in opposition to uh, the rest of the world. In some cases, I always feel like whenever the rest of the world feels happy, New York is at its bleakest and vice versa. You know, you look at the 60s and, you know, over in California, the Beach Boys are, are singing about surfing in, in New York. Uh, the Velvet Underground are singing heroin. Uh, in the 80s, everybody's uh, partying. And in New York, we've got, you know, Richard Kern and the, <laughs> the bleak underground scene. So there is just this kind of perpetual sense of New York being its own microcosm. And uh, as much as they say, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. You do kind of feel, especially with a film like this, this idea of just you've fallen into this entire world unto itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a world unto itself. It's a good way to think about it. And like, so those moments of like Niagara Falls, Coney Island, the, the nearby uh, holiday zones, you know, are, are also very sort of like carefully chosen, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that was Niagara Falls for the the longest time was the kind of honeymoon destination. The the other thing with this, I think, is it's so there's so many moments that you look at and and have to wonder if they found their way into other films intentionally or not. Uh, you know, like Tom mentioned, you know, obviously you wonder, oh, how, did the Cohen see this? But the the weird thing is, um, when they're having when we have that brief moment of narrative bliss, and Johnny is strumming a ukulele and silently singing to his wife, uh, I weirdly thought of Navin R. Johnson singing, "I'm picking out a thermos for you to." Uh, 
to Bernadette Peters and the jerk. Like you do wonder how much of this otherwise unseen film still kind of crept into mm. other people's work in so many different ways. Yeah. I mean, it was, I guess it wasn't a hit at the time, but it, it is, it has long been a recognized masterpiece, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it's a, it's a Thalberg movie. It's a, a big sort of MGM classic. Like, so even though, for whatever it didn't sell tickets like i don't know when it is that it sort of entered the cinematic canon but certainly like you said they made a sequel uh and someone like godard would be like well yeah the crowd obviously you know like you know would reference the crowd as like easily as someone would reference breathless today or whatever uh, well it is pretty funny because uh it's fitting that you are on the ep this episode because this movie was a blank check movie for king vidor they didn't really want to make it and but they were just like well he's made so many goddamn hits for us i mean we might as well just let him make it and even when it was made uh you know it says here that louis b mayer really hated the, the movie he just didn't like it and i guess it did enough like you said to get a sequel but uh, th this you know it's so unique and so uh trying to push things forward that you really needed a blank check to get something like this made in 28 did we, which reminds me, David, did we blow this for you? I know you guys probably had a, a King Vidor series ready to go in the chamber. Did we? Yeah, it's been the last three years. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I guess he would do, so his first movie was a short documentary called Hurricane in Galveston. It looks kind of, kind of cool. It's a lost film. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it makes sense that Louis B. Mayer watched it and was like, this thing is is too bleak. Like, you can't end it on the family has decided to weather its many tragedies and is part of the crowd. Like, you know, that sh we need more than that, surely. Like, surely the guy needs to get his big break. But, like, I know they made a happy ending that, like, they could tack on, right? There, there was, like, a, a an optional sort of, like, and then he got a great job, like, that you yeah. could have seen. And they're, like, at a Christmas tree or something. I've never seen it. But I don't think anyone watching this movie even then would be remotely convinced by that ending like it's not it wouldn't make any sense uh with what you've just seen like the movie is not about a guy becoming successful like there's nothing about this guy that strikes you as special i mean except for that he's a, a person who has feelings and like you know loves his wife and like, but it's not like you watch this movie and you're like god this guy must be just the best at advertising slogans i i was honestly kind of worried at in the ending in the movie that the guy he was sitting next to they were going to be like well actually i'm the head of an uh, ad agency and you did this oh i'm going to give you a big right. pile of money to work for me i was kind of like oh this is the happy ending they're going to give us because you got to have a happy ending but luckily they didn't and left it more on that um kind of triumphant but if you think about it for more than two seconds it's still kind of like well these people are in a bad situation this isn't good yeah but i i mean look the movie didn't do well so yeah. louis b mayer's right and fuck me but like how many <laughs> people could be watching this movie in 1928 1929 and be like well that's me like i lost a child i lost my job like you know like i can i can see that like uh King Vidor thinking like, well, I could be speaking to people. But then, of course, when you think of the Depression, you think of the films of the 30s. It's very obvious that like, no, audiences wanted comedy. They wanted fantasy. They wanted like highfalutin stuff. They wanted wackiness. They wanted zaniness like Gold Diggers and, of 1933 is like one of the best movies ever made about the Great Depression. Like, you know, like, you know, like it's definitely this kind of realism definitely was not um being called for until the 40s yeah, it's the oh. sullivan's travels dilemma yeah. well, the... louis v mayer also disliked the movie because uh there was a scene where you get to see it where he's in the bathroom and you see the toilet uh yeah sure well wow. he thought that was disgusting and uh he didn't want it in a movie he made but uh king fedor <laughs> overrode him i guess we need to see that toilet <laughs> you I know mean, what... there's that weird realism i guess again what else sticks out to me with this something speaking of realism i mean Again, we've all I, I can I can at least say this without speaking too much about any of these personal lives. We've all at some point uh cohabitated in a small apartment in New York with someone else. And uh as a result, that scene where it's the two of them just fighting about this one cabinet door and, and just so tense as though God has forsaken you because this, you know, this fold out bed is falling or something. Like you that still felt so I'm like, oh, I, I, I recognize myself in so many moments 
of John's journey in this film. And, you know, I, I, I found that so compelling in this that it, it so captures those moments. It's not, you know, David, you've talked in the past and I, I love it. I, uh, when you've talked about the problem with love stories and films that so often do this thing of the tension comes out of, well, I lied to you about this thing or I did this elaborate, you know, there was this elaborate problem we have to overcome because it feels so cheap. And with this, there's no elaborate problem. It's, it's the real issues that we all face from day to day and that are hard to overcome. Right, right. Uh, I, it's, nobody's lying about being a king or something. It's no. like, no, I'm just kind of uh, taking my frustrations out on my wife because I'm just an office drone and she's kind of getting fed up with this shit. Yeah, you know, I mean, I I think you know, just just a couple days ago, we were uh, my my partner and I were arguing about a about an outlet above the the kitchen counter, and you knew that that argument was not really about the outlet. That was you know, she's feeling overworked, I'm feeling underworked. It's uh, you know, it it happens, right? Uh, and I I think what I what I love about this is is that this film also doesn't do anything. You have those moments where she's saying, "Well, I'm actually going to go with my mother." Well, I'm having a baby. This is, there's these just so many. And the, the thing that really socked me in the jaw is, is it weirdly, you, you don't think about uh, lines really hitting you in a silent film, but there are so many lines in this film that just, when he looks at her and he says, do you understand me? Mm -hmm. I got choked up. This film is, is so brilliant that, that you're getting choked up at title cards. You know? A, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I like how simple and stark the title, title cards are, which is a hallmark of silent movie obviously but like just since everything in this movie is sort of a broad emotional stroke that just sort of makes a lot of sense to me and since we don't need like it it's sort of impressive how little detail we really need like how mythic his story is and in just in terms of like you know he was the son of a man and a woman and his mother died and he met a woman he loves and he had a friend and he, you know, like it's, it's so basic, but I feel like Vidor's whole point is like, it's, it's only basic in that, like, it's a story that everyone would recognize or it's a story, you know, that like that would speak to so many people. And what's great is that, you know, I, I've watched a lot of these silent films where they have these sort of, uh, what one could call flowery title cards of, you know, these very poetic lines that you kind of just you maybe roll your eyes at a bit. And this one earns every one of them. You know, yeah. if any other movie had months, endless months, the crowd laughs at you always, but it will cry with you for only a day. If any other film had that, you know, you probably roll your eyes, shrug it off, but you really feel that in this. He earns every one of those cards. Right. Yeah, Which he is, does. Yeah, I do love, um, you know, it is kind of broad and subtlety is not the, you know, thing you expect from a silent movie. I just do love the unspoken about thing that they're all like Johnny and his friend. They're, they're, it's, they're in prohibition and they're still just drinking and kind of getting into shenanigans. I mean, just him literally pulling out some gin underneath his bathtub <laughs> and then he's got to go find his friend, which again, to, in how frank the movie is, his friend's just drunk off his ass dancing with two dames and him and his friends spend the rest of the night drinking themselves stupid rooting christmas eve and i don't know just like that specificity like prohibition's still going on when this movie's out and them just being like yeah and the people working on the street and like blue collar guys they don't they don't care they're still drinking yeah, and i can't tell you tom how many times you know my girlfriend and i have a fight and then i go over to your place and you've got exactly two flappers uh just hanging out dancing to a record i mean it happens all the time right well, I have a type, so <laughs> don't don't shame me about that. Uh, I there was, but there's just so much with this. Um, I mean, and and things like again, if another movie did, let's let's talk about the the big moment. I think in this movie, and I'm uh, you know the the death of his daughter. Mm -hmm. That is, you know that that certainly uh, hit me like a ton of bricks. I know it hit Tom. That is that is a moment oh, yeah. that really I think. You know, we talked about it could be overdramatic. I, I think the fact that he just makes us sit in this pain is really engaging. It's interesting because the birth of the daughter is not even a moment in the movie. Like, it's it's addressed in a title card as they're sort of jumping forward. Like, oh, and then he had another kid. Like, you know, and things kept moving along. And, like, he got his raise. And I feel like Vidor is trying to be like, look, 
this entire system functions as it's supposed to function until there is this kind of a tragedy. And then it's like, you're just going to get left behind. Like there's just nothing you can do. Right. You know, like there, there's, there's no sort of institutional sympathy or help for him or for them. There's no time to grieve. Like you can't take the time you need to grieve. You got to get back to work. Otherwise you're just left in the crowd. Uh, It's pretty like, yeah. I mean, literally we're seeing that, today like right now with this yeah. pandemic that's going on which makes it all the more crazy that this movie came out on like what 92 years ago at this point jeez right yes yes correct 92 years ago wow uh it's funny you see 20s and you're like oh well, that was 80 years ago i still do that thing where i'm yeah. like the 20s were 80 years ago that's how long yeah. ago they were no, this, yeah. this film <laughs> hundred year anniversary is on its way which is what we have to weirdly uh uh, we weirdly have to hope for with this because it's so unavailable i was saying before we started to kyle that it's now a a race against the clock to see warner brothers has got three years to put this out on a on home video before it just falls into the public domain well this i i like i said to them this this is going to be a thing that kino will pick up and put out because they they they're kind of like the kings of doing the silent movies no, Kino, you're right, Tom. Kino's very good with distributing classics. I just got my copy of Cabin Boy. They're very good about the, those most iconic of films. Um, but no, there's that, that moment. There's, there's a moment where, and, I, and maybe it seems obvious, and I think if somebody had done this when we were in film school in one of their films, we would have brushed it off, but just him working at his desk and the projection on his head, first of the numbers, then of his daughter, and then the car, you're just like, oh, that, that gets it. That yeah. gets the idea of having to work through grief better than any monologue could. Power of silent movies, man. Yeah, and it's it's weird because I think um, now, David, if I if I missed, what did you did you study film specifically when you went to college? Were you an English major? What was your I was an English major? I didn't. I mean, I've only you know I just watched movies, um, but no, I was an English major, and that was in um, like that was the only subject I took because I went to school in England. You don't, there's no one's gonna, no one's gonna do a bit on you here, David. I was, I was worried. I have pontificated on this show, I think about like Takeshi's Castle and Monster Munch. So no, there's no, no, um, no right. So, you know, in England, you really only study one subject. So no, I, I, I never study film academically, um, except for just watching them a lot and reading a bunch of books, but that's about it. See, when we were in film school, like they, tr- the first year, your freshman year, you were not allowed to use sound in your films at all. And I think they were trying to impress on you the idea of being able to, you know, tell a story with no dialogue, being able to tell a story visually. But I feel like the examples they showed us didn't necessarily convey that, and everybody was just waiting to use sound. Right. And when you look at this, I, I keep thinking, like, there's so many points in this where it uses just sparingly. I mean, you know, there's the, the point where he's going to, he's grieving, he's going to kill himself. I mean, that's that's where you're leading up to at the end of this is is he's going to he's contemplating suicide, uh, which was also a much more common uh, narrative device in older films and older material, I find, is just sort of this matter of fact, well, nothing left to do, uh, whereas now it's played with such heightened tension. I mean, there's a I've got it sitting behind me. There's a Mickey Mouse comic strip where Mickey's going to shoot himself. So it was uh, played very differently in this time period. But it, it's, you know, when you have that line, uh, we don't know how big the crowd is, what opposition it is until we get out of step with it. And there's this moment where he's going to end it. And his son says to him, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Yeah. And that may seem trite, uh, you know, in, in other scripts. But I think about like just that element is so powerful. You know, a, a movie that I don't actually love. And I, I, it's a weird one to bring up here. But I, you guys have seen Parenthood, I assume, the, the Ron Howard film. Yeah. Sure, not not yeah. since I was a teenager, but I've seen it. Yeah, I I, I could not tell you what happens in ninety percent of that movie, but I remember even as a kid, well, you know, like a teenager watching it and having that scene where the the kid says to Steve Martin, "Dad, when I grow up, I wanna I wanna work where you work. That way we can see each other every day," and just feeling that line of being like, "Oh, okay, this this works." This one particular moment so captures what is. What this movie's trying to get at, too, I think, which is this realization that we have to have of John Sims will never mean anything to the city of New York. To most people in the entire universe. Yeah, but he means so much to this family he has built. 
Yeah. And and we all kind of deal with that. It's it's hard not to feel overwhelmed or feel small walking around Manhattan or Brooklyn, but then you come home and, you know, somebody asks how your day was or a, a little dog looks up at you and is excited to see you and that gets you through it. You know, there's there is something that I do love about this movie that I, you know, a lot of movies really don't kind of get into, which is that this idea that when you become a parent, uh you change and everything come becomes about your kids and that's not really true with Johnny Sims. It's like when he loses his kid, yeah, he's grieving and all that, and then he quits his job. But he really is all about m- trying to make himself feel important, and he can get a good job from his brother-in-laws, and he just won't do it. And he's kind of going to um, sentence his family to living poor because of his pride that is kind of, like I said, the bittersweet part of the ending it's i i i I don't know i feel like a lot of movies would not go that route of just saying no he's still kind of living to make himself feel good and feel like he's gonna be important i'm also i think we're all guilty of that i mean especially look uh you know uh uh tom david you guys are both uh writers i uh was and would like to be again (laughs) you know we're all in that boat to some degree and and we all suffer from those moments of envy or frustration i mean i'll be i'll be candid about the fact that my my partner is a uh, a very successful editor and she's having all kinds of great success and and i am the one with you know nothing to, to really show for it professionally and you kind of feel that thing that that sims is feeling which is you know johnny sims which is feeling worthless you know, feeling like, what do I really contribute? And the added pressure of her relatives kind of looking at him as a failure and and seeing him as as a waste. You do kind of feel this. You you, you it's it's weird because when you try and whether it's just being in a relationship, you know, a serious relationship, or starting a family or whatever it is, you do as much as it brings you comfort that you feel like you matter, you do also feel this added pressure to like, I have to be better now. I have to be good enough for this person. I have to prove myself. And you feel like Johnny throughout this has to prove himself. I mean, I, you know, there's that, how often he keeps repeating like, no, no, don't worry. We're going to have a big house when my ship comes in. Well, we're going to do this when my ship comes in, when the ship comes in, he keeps believing that that's going to work for him at some point. Right. And that makes sense in that, like, that's just sort of the whole purpose of the quote unquote American dream, right? It's like everyone will get their chance or, you know, everyone's sort of like entitled to their shot. And as long as you can sort of stand out from the crowd, you can climb the ladder or you can have that big breakthrough. And like, you know, I know my the history of my family, there was definitely a lot of that. Uh, sort of like, yeah, no, no, well, you know, like things are really going to get cooking when X happens, and it's sort of like a lot of waiting for X to happen. And as you're saying, Tom, and like as you guys are both saying, like the 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 the, the crucial moment is him realizing, like, oh, you know, I have something here, which is corny, but corny in the right way. Like it's it's sort of corny in this kind of mundane, kind of sad, but you know, very beautiful way. And like that's why the ending has to be the ending. The ending has to be him accepting his lot in life, which is both nice and tragic. And his lot in life is to be part of the crowd. Maybe it's because I went in blind, not knowing exactly what this movie was going to be. But I was uh, very like impressed and taken aback by the just storytelling symmetry of him shitting on the the juggler in the beginning, and then he becomes the juggler. Right. You know, maybe, you know that's just you know not knowing where this movie was going because I didn't expect it to go as dark as it did but I just love that that storytelling moment of him of you realizing oh he's finally come full circle and he's now the guy people on the train on the the double decker bus are going to be making fun of now yeah and Tom you know in the sequel our daily bread he's there as the clown and then four kids hit him in the face with his sign and then he shoots a television talk show host that's the story arc and that's the story arc of uh I hate that movie poisoned my brain so much that as soon as they showed the clown with the sandwich board, I was like, that's the first thing I jumped to uh, was Todd Phillips, the Joker. Before we we wrap up, uh, we always try and end talking about uh, the Academy Awards and whether these films did well there and how the, the mark of how they were received at the time. This was nominated 
I guess you could maybe say best picture, not really. I guess they were sort of, they, they, that, that was part of the argument, right? It's like, well, we gave two best pictures in the first year. And it's like, yeah, it was in the first year, like, you know, the, uh, and still to this day, no one can really explain the difference. Now, the way I've always understood the difference is that, like, best picture, which is what Wings won, right? Yes. Like, the, the acknowledged sort of first winner of best picture, was more like best production. So it was like, great job on such an incredibly well-mounted technical achievement. Like, like this movie was such a, so incredibly well-produced. And then Unique and Artistic Picture is more like, like sort of the most the artful most artful movie of the year which you would think of as best picture like i've always sort of thought like sunrise might really be the first best picture winner like obviously it doesn't work that way because i think technically wings won quote an outstanding picture uh but sunrise is the best movie of the year i, mean, I think they were folding two years in but right like you know like sunrise is like a staggering achievement and i and wings is 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 cool like i I don't hate wings but you know i i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna say something that may be controversial to the five people listening to this who who are passionately vested in the oscars i don't even think wings is the best film in that film in that set of nominees Uh, because you've also seventh heaven circuit obviously circus had its nominations revoked uh that was the thing with that year they they nominated Chaplin for director, actor, picture, and then they were like, oh, he'll win everything, so let's just give him one, and then... They gave him, like, a special award or whatever. I mean, look, they were figuring stuff out. Yeah. But oh, that... No, wait, ha- Heaven is a nominee that year, right? Yeah, right, Seventh yeah. Heaven. It's the, the nominees for the, the general, you know, populist picture were Wings, Seventh Heaven, and The Racket. But here, you were talking about, oh, best artistic achievement as opposed to best technical, and even that is kind of confounding because... Yes, that's true of Sunrise, and yes, that's true of The Crowd, but the other nominee for a unique and artistic picture is Chang, which is a half-narrative, half-ethnographic documentary by Marion C. Cooper. Got a tiger. Uh, it's, it, not, it's about a boy in a village, too. It's, it's, and there's elephants. It's, it's very... I, I don't even know how to describe it without sounding... Uh, it's it's got it gives you kind of mondo kane vibes at points it's a weird one but i in any event uh, the crowd was nominated for outstanding artistic picture as, as david indicated uh lost to sunrise a song of two humans which is another uh heart-wrenching dramatic story of a couple trying to get by i mean obviously an incredible movie and like i think uh Vidor acknowledged his indebtedness to like Murno and Lang. Like, yeah. like, you know, that he was very intrigued by these German movies. I know Sunrise is a Hollywood movie, but that's Murno. But the other nomination it got was Best Director of a Dramatic Picture, which it lost to Frank Borzage for Seventh Heaven. So crowd walked away from the Oscars uh completely uh empty handed. But managed to survive and have a, a I argue a stronger legacy than than uh, not perhaps Sunrise, but many of the films that were nominated that year. But as we were discussing, it's not available for people to see now, which is a big, a bit of an issue. I mean, if you if you know where to look, I don't want to I don't want to rat you, David. How did you rewatch this? Did you have a copy of it, or um... <laughs> if you don't want to admit it, I'm we probably got it from the same place. Yeah, we got it from. I imagine. I mean, I, I like I said, I think I first watched it on Filmstruck because this is owned. It's owned by Warner. Like yeah, it's part of the M library, which they own. Um, so it wouldn't be too hard for them to put it on HBO Max or whatever it is they want to do. I don't know what their approach to their sort of TCM channel has been so far. Like it, it's a it's a perfectly good library that they have up there, but it's not as beefy as the old like film struck da- library david this sure was why. this was me and kyle's entire conversation on mike before you jumped in was just me railing against it like at the same time it's like you know the crowd is a national film registry inaugural class movie it's seems like something you could include i don't know they also and we were discussing this too they do so many films from the warner archive on dvd that are m- like made to order you know, yeah. so they if I decide I want to buy a Napolis salute, they will just make that on the spot because I bought it. Why is something like the crowd not available is confounding. David, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I, I do want to say to your credit, um, you know, we I met you as as all of us met you uh, working at a, at a movie theater in New York. 
And you, when you work in a movie theater in New York, you, know, you, you see a lot of people who are part of the, you know, from the film industry or the film Twitter crowd or anything like that. And, and you have a pretty good sense of uh, which, which people see you as, as a person and which people see you as a ticket dispenser. Um, sure, and right. to your credit, you were one of the people who, if you were coming in, you always went out of your way to say hi. And, you know, and stop by and talk. And I, I, for, I think all of us who have worked that kind of, uh, you know, minimum wagey job, I can't tell you how much that means. Really, it seems like a minor thing, but I you you remember it, you know. No, no, I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, I miss it so bad. Uh, yeah, as I'm sure <laughs> people do, just going to the movies. I should I should be uh, planning my trip. Well, not planning, but getting ready to go to Texas next week for Fantastic Fest. But uh, clearly, that's uh, not happening. So, pretty disappointed about that. But uh, yeah, no, this was an um, absolute pleasure for me. Uh, big, like I said, big fan of the show. Um, just one, spe- I don't think I laughed harder at anything than in one of the Michael Mann episodes than you saying, "If I explained what this show was to Michael Mann, he would shoot me with a zip gun." One of the hardest I've ever laughed, and um, this was a absolute uh, treasure. And uh, thank you so much for being here. This was a just that's the best. Thank you. At the beginning of the episode, David had mentioned the Godard quote, and that was actually something that I was well, I wanted to bring up in the outro, um, especially now. Um, you know, we talked about the crowd coming out around the Great Depression and how this is very much a, I guess, like a slice of life movie in a way, very very normal life, and how in such a dark time in our history, something as simple as just watching somebody live their life and grow up was entertainment. And now that we're in a very similar, but still very to be determined uh, circumstance here, um, sort of the mediums, I guess, that we gravitate towards in that um, in that regard too, just because our entire life um, is just turned upside down. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, this was a hard one for me, and I don't mean a hard one for me in terms of like hard to figure out what to talk about or you know the episode, but just this movie was hard it was it really hit me you know i mean obviously he starts out the main action film is 21 and trying to make it but like i'm in new york i'm trying we're all trying and so much of it felt so relatable and and not a lot of movies do that not a lot of movies maybe because audiences don't really want them um but not as as many movies are willing to make you feel the undeniable hurt, you know, the, the hurt that you can't say is someone's fault. It's not Johnny Sim's fault that he isn't successful. I, I think about, and not the most recent film, uh, which I don't love and Tom didn't love either, but like part of what people gravitate to Charlie Kaufman for is the fact that Charlie Kaufman's films, especially Synecdoche and Anomalisa, are about these just unavoidable sad feelings that come with being alive the difficulty of of that that life is not this question you know maybe we'll go back to something that that kyle uh and i both love and bonded over and tom too of course but i i got kyle hooked on this was was mad men and that don draper quote of what is happiness it's a moment before you need more happiness there's that way of kind of looking at life and its potential fairness and 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 life is not fair in this film well, you know, I, it 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 is what what's very interesting to me about this movie that I think is you know makes it really great and very timely and timeless is um yes it's very clearly attack you know calling out the system and saying it's you know a meat grinder and if you don't stay in line you're gonna fall behind you'll end up part of the crowd but I do think it is interesting that it it is kind of putting the blame on Johnny Sims for believing his own hype Mm -hmm. and not really being able to just suck it up and say, okay, well, other people rely on me. I could have had the career my friend had if I didn't just keep digging myself deeper and deeper into my own, into this own hype man thing I got for myself. Well, my ship's going to come in. My ship's going to come in instead of just, well, no, you're, you, you you got a family your ship is not coming in just do the work and 
just do what you need to do. And especially at, you know, when his child dies and he quits, it's like they keep showing him. It's like you keep getting jobs. What, what, like what I think the title call was like the sixth job he's had in four weeks or whatever, where you just go and they show you, oh, well, you know, who, who, who wants to sell uh, um, vacuums anyway? It's, it's not important or whatever. And you're like, OK, dude, your family's going hungry. Just, yeah, the system sucks, but it, it it's which is funny that it feels like something a lot of people are kind of having to deal with today. I mean, even before 2020 decided to become the biggest fucking German shit porn in the world, which was like people that, you know, move into New York or move into L.A. or in like now this place, like moving to Austin. It's like all these people just believe in, oh, if I move to this place, people will just know that I'm great because everyone growing up told me I was great. And it's like, no, that's not the world. And I think that's it. it, it it's funny because I, I, you know, I, I had a little bit of that shit, too, man. You know, before I I mean, bef- this job I have now is the best job I've ever had by a country mile. But before I had that, you know, I had Alamo and that was the best job I ever had. And But before I had Alamo, I was stuck in a goddamn factory thinking, well, well, you know, I'm great. I just got to wait for my my job to come in. And I wasn't actually doing the thing I wanted to do. And, you know, it's 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 why I keep keep harping on this thing. I'm like, holy shit, this movie feels like, yeah, it's a silent and, you know, it's not as technically polished as movies in 2020 can be. But it's like, fuck, this movie feels like it's really honed in on shit that hasn't changed in 92 years. And and I think for us in particular i mean look i'm not going to get the specifics but i know that each one of us on this show is guilty of having those same thoughts and is still guilty of them and still does them of those thoughts of like no 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 but if i just do this one thing or making some decision or making some rash choice that looking back we go that was not maybe the right move that was kind yeah. of foolish i let my ego take control and you know may still uh continue to do so and I think that this film is kind of like a warning for that. And I'm certainly feeling it. I mean, this this one, re- I mean, you know, one of the ones I hadn't seen uh, in full before, but it really, I mean, to the point where, Tom, as you're talking about, as you are directing comments to the fictional character of Johnny Sims, I'm feeling them all as though you're yelling at me. Uh, so this is this was rough and in a good way. And I'm really glad we did it. I'm really glad that David picked it. I'm glad he's the one uh, that we had on for it. Uh, I'm glad we got to talk about his family history on cinematic form. Yeah, I'm glad we did it. And, you know, I, I think that, Kyle, when we started out doing this, you had asked, like, well, do I have to watch the movies too? And I was like, well, you should. It would help. And I, I think that thus far, uh, it's it's been equally rewarding for you as it's been for us, I think, not to speak for you. but No, 100%, 100%. You know, obviously, again, our objective is to shed some light on these films and to find their value. And uh, in a large majority of these films are movies I haven't seen. So who would I be if uh, I didn't actually put the time in to watch the movies and then uh, discuss them? So yeah, this the crowd, the crowd was easily... One of the one of the ones that we've done so far that I was I wasn't expecting to have an opinion of one way or the other. Um, ended up really enjoying it. Um, so yeah. And if people uh, are wondering how can I watch the crowd, um, because it's unavailable, I'll just I'm not going to tell anybody anything inappropriate or anything like that. Yo ho, yo ho. Just hope that some org, as an organization, has archived this film. Just. Some kind of archive org uh, would, would, would preserve this film. And just try and find one, and I'm sure it'll work out for you, you know? I think that'll help. Yo-ho, yo-ho. <laughs> well, that's not, that's, sure, that too. Uh, maybe. Um, that's the, it, that. Hey, I wasn't thinking at anything. I was just yeah. saying yo-ho, let's yo-ho. Talk about, I, mean, I mean, like, really, accessibility, I, I will, I go out of my way to not pirate films. You know, I still have a DVD Netflix subscription for that reason. It is so exhausting that there are certain movies that, like, if you want to watch The Crowd, if you want to watch Il Postino, which is a pretty recent film, not a chance. No world can you find that anywhere other than the VHS. Um, which is why we got to celebrate people like Kino Lorber, who uh, make it possible for me to co- get a copy of the Eleanor Roosevelt story, or the recently departed Twilight Time that gave me a, got, I was able to get the complete Blondie television series. Uh, you know, little things like I that. Mean- that's that's why you know I I'm big big Blu-ray component. I'm a big Blu-ray fan. I love these all these companies that are kind of 
spitting in the eye of the very idea that home video is not no longer worthy and is kind of dying because uh they're still doing some really great and crazy shit and as much as we would love if a if there was more stuff that's kind of hard to find getting out, I mean, at a certain point, I think these companies are going to start getting, it's going to, it's getting to that point of like, I mean, I don't know, you know, like if it's before or after the copyright lapses, I mean, there's, I, I don't think there's no way that like Kino or Olive Films doesn't just say, fuck it, we're putting the crowd out because it's literally one of the most important movies ever made. And I mean, we have no, there's no overhead at this point now. We could just do it. And man, oh man, Tom, am I excited for in a couple seasons? I don't know exactly how long, because I think there, there's there's a couple more King Vidor um, films in the registry. Uh, there's <sighs> Daily Bread, our, our Daily Bread, which is the sequel, which we you know talked about a little bit. Yeah. Um, but then in a couple seasons, I don't know. I was trying to look up how many, and I I, I don't see it. But um, we get to do the big parade which is his film, the guarantor that gave him the blank check for this one. And I think you are going to have a real good time with that one. That is, that is quite the picture. So I'm very excited to do so. Uh, season four. So not that far away. The big parade world war one movie, which ties into uh, what will probably be our next episode. Talking to somebody who also made a world war one movie Hint him. One last thing I just wanted to address about the accessibility thing, and, uh, you know, and Tom had kind of mentioned it too, and I think part of the conversation is that I think businesses in general are starting to recognize that it is easier to sell you a streaming service or a license of something rather than the physical copy, and oh, yeah. I'm over here thinking, why am I being forced to make a decision? I mean, obvious. look, I'm not movie related, but... I'm very excited for the PlayStation 5 to come out if I can ever find a damn pre-order, but there's two different versions. There's a digital edition and there's one with a hard or a, a disk drive. And it sounds like for the most part, the majority of people who say, yeah, I'm getting this day one are getting the one with the discs because that physical media is still important to them. Yeah. And they are aware of, you know, what sort of things they gravitate towards that they're going to want digital, that you know the type of stuff that you want to have a physical copy of. And I would like to hopefully be in a position where we can, I don't know, not necessarily have a majority of things transition to digital necessarily, but if things start to um, get re-released in these uh, physical mediums, if they decide to do another 4K star wars with some actual good shit in it or something um that it's there's more value behind it i don't really i made a decision to myself in the middle of the you know in the middle of all of this chaos that rather than just buy a bunch of physical movies i want i, I get steelbooks i want something that's like hey i'm keeping this this is not something that i can just give to somebody or something that i don't want to treat with value it's like this is i went out of my way to purchase something in a in a nice physical container that i can keep with me and hold on to and if there's something i want to get uh, added to my itunes collection for like 4.99 then great i can i can do that no problem i just i guess i'm tired the, of the conversation that it has to be one or the other for any medium i mean i think that i think it's also a matter of people do not uh, people don't really value media as much and, and think that it has any worth I think that the advent of streaming services has made it such that people don't think they have to pay for things. Um, I mean, you pay for a streaming service, but I think about the fact that right. the people, people seem to think that they'd be more on board to pay for things than they are. Like, I think if you turned around to somebody and said, you know, like, how many people are turning around going, oh, just put Tenant on VOD already. Just put it on VOD. Just put it on VOD. And I'm like, there's no price point where you'll actually think it's reasonable for Tenant. I promise you, there's no price point. Because even those people are like, I'd pay, uh, you know, oh, you told me I had to, if they're now telling themselves, oh, if you told me I had to subscribe to HBO Max and then pay $30 and I'd get access to Tenant, they're like, oh, I'd totally do that. No, you wouldn't. Like, they will no. always need to be cheaper. It will always need to be less. It will always need to be... I mean, I, I remember going back to college, having an argument with a guy who tried to tell me that it, he was right. It was totally okay for him to pirate music because he couldn't afford it otherwise. And it's not wow. fair for him to have to pay for something that he wants to be able to listen to. And it's like, well, that's not how that fucking works. Like, you know, and I see that with 
this kind of even some people who are like, oh, it's unfair that this movie that 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 only certain people can can see this movie at a digital film festival. Just release it online for everyone. It's like, hey man, just have a modicum of patience and accept that maybe you have to exchange money for things. Right, and I'm and it's and it's funny. I mean, I've grown up kind of in the obviously in the evolving world of like LimeWire and you know the Pirate Bay and and whatnot. And so my relationship with music and stuff is complicated too. And yet, um or accessing music is complicated and yet come 2011 2012 spotify gets you know takes off and basically says hey do you like music here is all of the music just give us one you know just give us a monthly fee and then something in my brain went off that was like well why do i need to go out of my way to access this music either early or you know legally if there is a a, a system that will allow me to do so now obviously there's you know whole conversations we could have about how they get paid and all of that and stuff and it's if you give a if you provide a platform for people to access a bunch of things you'll watch it i mean mike you always talk about all of the things on on disney plus that you would not go out of your way to hunt for yeah. but if they throw it on there you're gonna watch it of course but i also think i mean i think about uh not to get too off topic and we'll wrap this up and i don't know how much this kyle's gonna keep any of it I think about Movie Pass and my big my, why I despise. <laughs> why do you think about Movie Pass? Why, Kyle? No, really, I'll tell you why. Because the the fact that the subscription based movie ticket thing was one of the worst things to happen to that. <laughs> um, no, yeah, because I think it, yeah, because I think it it devalued the process of of movie going. You know, I think that there used to be an idea of you know box office reports now were based on like I'll. You know, I I will give money to see this thing. I will give you money in exchange for this thing. And you would think the people who had the pie in the sky dream of this, and we all dealt with this, you know, with ticket sales, had the pie in the sky dream of like, well, it'll mean people will go see more movies and experience the magic of cinema, and 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 they'll appreciate it. And instead, what you got were people who would show up and and they'd hand me the movie pass card, and I'd swipe it and go, hey, you're not allowed to see this movie. Like you've already you've already used your movie pass credit for the day, and they're like, yeah, whatever, you don't lose money on it. Who cares? Come on, just let me go and buy. I'm like, you're not even. <laughs> that's the thing. It was. It was this idea of like you were paying five. But how much? How much was it a month for that? That stupid oh, fucking God. thing. Didn't was wasn't it upwards of twenty bucks a month? At Some one point? bullshit. Whatever it was. Like you were essentially like after seeing three movies, you basically got a free movie ticket, and it still wasn't enough. It no. will never be enough, and that's the thing that gets to me. Is it's like, yeah, I bought the premium access to Mulan because I wanted to see it, and for me. I don't have a problem with buying a digital copy of a film. And yes, I have to maintain a subscription to a service that gives me access to, I would say, a quarter of the archive of an entire film studio. And same thing, like, if they decided that Tenet was going on HBO Max and I had to pay an extra $30 premium access, I don't have a problem with that. I don't know if I'll do it because I don't really care. Um, I'm not that into Tenet. Um, I'm happy it exists, and I'll probably watch it at some point, but I'm not in a rush. Uh, as many people felt about Mulan, and I'm not going to fault anybody for that, but I think that the idea of anybody who has this idea of like, oh, well, I would totally be willing to... How many people would be like, it's too expensive to go to the movies. I would totally pay that same amount to watch it in my home. And now the option's there to like, well, you can pay this amount and watch it in your home, and people go, that's too much. The one thing I do appreciate is... Um... You know, my grandfather a couple of years ago uh, suffered a stroke, which he's still been recovering from. And so a lot of the things that he used to do, uh, he no longer can. And so the time that he has has now been replaced with Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max. And um, he consumes everything. And it's set up for him in a way that um, he can he can he can access it. And I just visited him yesterday and out of the blue, he's like, hey, can I get for whom the bell tolls? And I genuinely did not know, but we were able to find the Apple TV app and determine that, yeah, you can get it on Peacock. Yeah. And I was able to set that up and everything. So, you know, uh, and I've also just been promoting the show to him, too. Like, hey, we're talking about a lot of the <laughs> movies that you've seen, you know, like you will like this. So as long as you don't care about a couple of fucks from Tom every once in a while, you're you're going to be fine. So to wrap up this thought. It is uh, streaming is great. It allows us access to so many things. I'm very happy. I'm not against streaming platforms at all. I should not be the only way to access this stuff because then that essentially means if tomorrow, uh, if tomorrow Disney Plus implodes, I have no way of ever accessing half of this stuff again. 
And the same way, the registry exists for this purpose. The registry exists to ensure that these things exist, that even if Ted Turner wanted to colorize Citizen Kane, the original still exists. And there's a lot of films and things. I mean, what we're talking about here, we're not just talking about, you know, movies that, oh, I think this is really good and should be preserved. It's also in some time, in some cases, us going, well, here's a thing that needs to be around. It needs to exist in some form. We cannot just leave it up to Universal to have it sitting in its vault that could one day catch fire. You know, to to tie it into a thing that, uh, and, and I'll bring it up on another episode when I suggest it should be in the registry, but tie it into a subject that Tom maybe hates. Uh, you, Muppet Vision 3D is a, a 3D movie that plays in Disney's Hollywood Studios. That's the only place it's playing right now, I believe. Uh, and it is the last thing Jim Henson worked on before he died. If they decide to take this ride out of a theme park, the last film Jim Henson ever made will be entirely inaccessible, other than cam rips on YouTube. There's got to be something else. There's got to be a way to preserve this. You know, like that kind of a thing. And maybe that means nothing to the general public, but if you're a Henson scholar, you want to have access to this stuff. The same way, if I was doing a study on Henson, I can go to the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens and be like, can I please, what do I have to do to watch Timepiece, his Oscar-nominated short? And they have a copy of that. They're able to make that accessible to people. And I think that's really what this is all about. So as we wrap things up, um, fellas, what film would you select um, that's not already in the registry? For those that don't know, film has to be at least 10 years old, and it needs to be an American film in order to qualify for the National Film Registry. So what are your picks, gents? So for me, I was thinking about, um, you know, there's so much with this film, despite being, you know, uh, a, a single story about being in New York, feeling part of the crowd. There's so much to draw from in this. And I'm sure that, you know, I could have gone a million different ways uh, and made it work. And I, I, when I first finished watching it, I really struggled for a minute. Like, what am I going to pick? What, what is going to be the, the film that I go with for this? How am I going to tie it in? And then... Uh, over the, the, by the end of the evening, I realized there was one thing that really stuck with me and really hit me, which is how profoundly wounded I had become by the death of the daughter. That scene and the look on his face and the way he carries her body through that throng around him and the way that it haunts him. And I tried to think of when was the last time, because people die in movies all the time, right? And most often, I, I feel like it's a narrative crutch, and it's done to cheaply get an emotional rise out of the audience. There are a few things I dislike more in a movie than when I see it's doing something that's an obvious button push. And Tom's heard me rant about pushing the button a men million times, but I hate those obvious button pushes. Whether it's child nostalgia or, or character death or anything like that, where it's just like, we know this will get a reaction out of people, so let's do it. And this wasn't a button push. This was undeniably, truly grappling with the tragedy of it and making you sit in that tragedy of it. And kind of the banality of tragedy in modern life, the way that the world continues to go on around you. And you're the, you feel like you're the only person that can possibly, or the only person that is actually feeling the right way because everybody else is just moving on. And I was trying to think of the last time a movie made me feel that. The last time a movie had a moment that was that emotional, especially the death of a child, that emotional, and it felt sincere to me, and it felt honest to me, and it really hit me. And once I started thinking about that, the film I thought of really kind of fits the crowd in a way in terms of how it's also about being lost in the shuffle of life. Another film that, that really is just about this thing that movies don't do that often of just life isn't fair life isn't necessarily even that good but we're kind of getting by and we're just doing what we can um and it's somehow not in the registry which stuns me because it was a huge hit and an oscar winner um which is uh james l brooks's terms of endearment it's a movie that if somebody describes it to you you're most likely going to kind of cynically go yeah okay yeah sure 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 but then you watch it and it hits you like a ton of bricks. It is so honest, so sincere, and the the give my daughter the shot scene hits me 
in the same exact way that Sims carrying his daughter's body hit me. I'm I'm truly just surprised. I I keep doubting myself and going back to check if it's actually in because it should be. And it's just such a quintessential American film and one of the best films of the 1980s uh and it hits the same exact spot the crowd does except obviously about a mother and a daughter. Uh, just a profound film and I I that would be my nomination for the registry. That's a good call. I love Terms of Endearment and uh just the uh... On a personal level, Jack Nicholson's operating on a on a nuclear level of Jack in that movie. So obviously, I I love it a bunch just for that alone. But yeah, everything else in that movie is pretty fucking great. So for me, when it came to this, um, like Mike said, there was a lot of angles you could have taken for this. Um, I started thinking about the the child aspect of it. I was looking at that, thinking about that, and I had a few options there. But I think for me, the thing that really stuck with me, I think is one of the big things that makes the movie such an icon and made it such a big, important movie is it's uh, tackling of the system of capitalism, of the grinding people into gear, into a, you know, they've become part of the m- machine. And if you step one bit out of, out of pace with everyone else, you're going to fall behind. And like the movie says, you will just become a part of the crowd and you will become forgotten and uh, you'll barely be able to survive, barely be able to keep your head above water. So I started thinking about that. And there are a bunch of good movies that have come out since then that are clearly influenced by it in an obvious way or in a subtle subconscious way. But there's one movie that I think that has been really, really shockingly timely in the last, let's say, 12 years since, let's say, the banking crisis, a movie that has aged like fine wine and keeps aging like fine wine, a movie that was so good at taking the system down and really just attacking capitalism that the right wing tried to co-op the movie for itself and actually saying, oh, well, no, actually, it's actually saying uh, our ideas are good. It's this and blah, blah, blah where um, the director had to come out and say, no, fuck you, this movie says you guys are evil, and it's not pro-you. The movie is They Live. And it's a movie that at the time, a lot of people dismissed as, oh, it's that movie with the wrestler? Yeah, it's kind of stupid, but I honestly don't think, even in a decade that gave us really great mm, political satires hidden in a B-movie package like RoboCop, or stuff like, I mean, there was a lot in the 80s that was kind of doing this. I don't think anything is better than they live at really just wrangling up the feeling of hopelessness, the feeling that the entire system is designed to keep you down because it is designed to keep you down. It's putting it into a sci-fi package by saying it's aliens that are that know how to keep the lower class down, keep them in the lower class and make sure they never get out of it unless they sell their souls and sell out their other, sell out the others in their group for just a little piece of the pie. I mean, I don't think there's any sci-fi just idea, even more so than anything introduced in the matrix. I don't think there's anything more just simple and potent than the idea of the sunglasses that just show you the world as it is. I mean, it's, and, and as much as it's iconic in how over the top it is, the fight scene is thematically rich and just, it, it feels like having to get into a knockdown drag out fight with someone to try to get them to see the truth when they don't want to. I mean, we're literally, we're living in that for the last four years of watching the people we thought we knew and loved in some cases for some people all of a sudden being brainwashed by Fox news, by Breitbart, by the right wing and trying to get to see these people, trying to get these people to see the truth is like this movie put bringing them in a back alley and trying to beat the shit out of them until they put the goddamn glasses on and see what's around them, which is you're a pawn. You're just something for these rich people to eat and profit off of. You're nothing. And for a movie, for, for something that I think the movie that for the crowd, really the capitalism and the system, the political t- satire of it, I think um, there is a pretty clear line in 
John Carpenter saying, well, okay, you can't just do the crowd, so let me take the sci-fi route and really show you the system is designed to keep you down and grind you up. So my pick is, uh, shouldn't be a shock for the two fellas that I'm recording with that it's a John Carpenter movie that they live. Thank you for listening. And thanks to David Sims for joining us. You can check out his podcast, Blank Check, with Griffin and David every Sunday, wherever you get your podcasts. And follow him on social media at David L. Sims. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. And you can find me at Theatricality with a K. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.